How is it living in Korea? Is a question most of us are asked at some point. Uh, most people expect to hear a good soju anecdote, a general comment on work, and a healthy grousing about the traffic. Every now and then, someone comes along that breaks the traditional box that expats are sometimes placed into. Today's guest is Philip Brett. He noticed a gap in the live music scene upon arrival and has gone on to do something about it. Music festivals, magazines, and podcasts. In addition to the whole being a teacher thing. So how is it, you ask? I don't think a simple good or bad can fully answer the question. Perhaps it's what you make of it is better. Hope you enjoy. You are now tuned into This Korean Life with your hosts, Brian and Nate. No, I don't. <laughs> Anyways, welcome back to another episode of This Korean Life. Today, in house, we got Philip Brett, Ulsan, native, Busan, native, Bu- Bu- been to Busan, <laughs> spent a year in uh, Jeju, now off to Daegu by way of Galway. Welcome, my man. Welcome, welcome. Thank you. Again, I remember the first time we met. I think it was a, a very good indication of your of your character. We're doing uh, we're selling yeah, we're selling pulled pork at uh, at Harry Bush's market. Do you remember that? Philip I don't actually remember the meeting, but I do remember buying something with pulled pork yeah. at the market. Yeah. I'm just I'm terrible at remembering people in general. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So what just I mean you stood out because you know, I was just trying to make small talk and said, Hey, what are you up to? And I mean ninety percent of the ninety nine percent of the people that we meet, they were just teachers and mm-hmm. you said oh you know i do a little bit of uh promoting here and there it's kind of bringing international bands in and uh and he, like you but you were so mild about it and i was like what what do you mean who who's in the music scene out of the out of the foreigners and then you know as uh as i come to know you you do angle magazine uh amp podcast or angle magazine podcast i guess and the big day south so, anyways, welcome, uh, welcome back to Ulsan. Thank you. Glad to, uh, glad to have you. Yeah, it's like my Korean hometown, I guess. Yeah. Do you feel, yeah. do you feel at home when you, uh, when you come through? Yeah, there's, you know, there's a, there's the familiarity is always going to be there, no matter how much it is changing, and it, like, oh, it changes every know. single time I'm back. No but, doubt. Yeah, the last time I was down in old downtown, just wandering around, uh, seeing how much like the Culture Street area has changed. Or it's cool, eh? Like it, yeah, it's been really nice to turn up. Mm-hmm. Um, but it took me a second to to orientate myself the last time I came back. I ended up walking from Samsung over to Songnam, and it was just... Um, did I, I used to do this. I was like, what? How did I go? How do I get there? Just yeah. trying to figure out what, what road do I have to take. What's, but, your, uh, what's the places you got to hit when you're when you're back? Sadly, Seamus is gone, which yeah, yeah. is a bit of a loss, I think, because um, like Shauna Gorman was doing great stuff there. Sure, well, absolutely. You know, I think they were kind of perfect match between venue and uh, yeah. event. So it was always something if I was going to be around for that, it would have been along for that. Yeah. Outside of there, I, it's kind of predictable. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Fingers or Lanker, <laughs> I'll stop in and say hello. Cool. Um, there was a couple of restaurants and things that I loved. They're all gone. Yeah. Coffee shops I like are still going. So. Um, yeah, the restaurants have taken a big hit since the shipyard's gone down. It's, oh, sure. It's changed a lot. Yeah. <clears throat> I was at Grappa last night or Saturday night. Remember Grappa and Donggu? I do. The pizzeria. Oh, man. I was there and we were just talking that it's one of the only places that has survived. Wow. You know. The, they got a good product. They got a solid pizza. What was, uh, what was the but they, they've one? evolved. Bella di Notte, maybe. That was the one down by... Um, in Samsung. Yeah, yeah. That was the other Italian place. I yeah. remember. Yep. But I, we were laughing yesterday with the owner there that it used to be probably 90% foreigners and 10% Koreans. And now it's probably 95% Koreans. Yeah. But he's he's innovated and he's he's evolved with the demand. And, and now he's still going. But so many of them have closed down and... Mm-hmm. Do they still have the the same menu or basically the yeah, same? It's uh, all the same. 100%. Beautiful. That's a good uh, man. That that's something I really long for uh, when I go home. There's a couple of places in in town that have that wood fired oven pizza, and it's you can't beat it, man. And they do they do a pretty good job, I think. I used to always stop into <clears throat> Iron Burger as well. Do you remember that place? No. Go to there. They started out in Donggu first, and they opened one in Songnam. Burger Mugger. It was called I'm Gour- I'm Gourmet, mm. and then they had a place in Songnam mm. called. 
or I'm burger and I'm gourmet. I think hmm. those are two Usually different. I don't have a problem finding the burger places. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know um, if those ring a bell or not. It was running around the same time as Toolbox <clears throat> when it was still active. Oh, Toolbox, yeah. yeah. Um, I tended to prefer the I'm gourmet burgers. Mm. Like, there wasn't a huge difference between them, to be honest, but I think just the, the, the meal that would be put together yeah. was a little bit easier. I remember when Toolbox switched up to actually having toolbox instead of a plate that was um, <laughs> one of those interesting ones and i actually ended up back in that space the last time i came through without realizing it I came up to meet some friends and one of them was sitting in just in a coffee shop doing mm. some work so they're like okay come to this place and i walked in i was like this place is really really familiar <laughs> everything eventually becomes a coffee and, shop yeah right? it wasn't until <laughs> i went out to the toilets i was like wait this is this was toolbox right yeah. but um it's just funny how much it's changing i had the same uh, experience a couple weeks back where I was in a coffee shop <clears throat> with uh, with Ben. They do the the coding meetup, and he said, "I said, oh, this is a nice space." He goes, "You used to work here." What are you talking about? He goes, "This is the." I'm like, "Oh my god, it is! Wow. That, that's where the kids, you know, that's where the kids did this." I was, and all the memories come flooding back. I was like, "Whoa, it was so weird." It was a completely different. Uh, There's just not completely... so much turnover at home. I mean, here it's yeah, it's nonstop. I mean, it's far hard to find staples that actually stay around for more than a couple of years. Jeez. How about that? I was shocked. I went down to uh, across from Mulsan Day, and I sent you that picture. Man, I don't even know how to describe it. It looks like something out of a Japanese, like uh, oh, like yeah. a Ghibli, a Ghibli studio uh, creation. And it's just this massive, like I don't even know how to describe it. It's like a it's many like a wall windows. Of lanterns or something. Wow. Wall it's, of it's lanterns, what? like protruding windows. I don't know. It's weird. We'll post it on the Instagram, but it was really cool. And that's, I mean, in the middle of Corona walking down that street you see lots of places have closed but other ones other people are going all in pretty yeah, cool i don't i don't know if this is the right time to be opening up yeah. no doubt how were things back home when you uh oh um it was a bit of it was definitely a bit of a reverse culture shock when i got back i in general or, or because of corona both yeah mm. um i got off the plane uh, I, I flew back through Qatar mm. uh, and Qatar Airways, so, or so I stopped in Doha and then changed on into Dublin. And uh, between Seoul, between Incheon Airport and Doha Airport, just seeing the way things were set up, the way things were, you know, you'd have seats kind of marked off, you couldn't sit in certain places, whatever. Mm. Um, all the staff in their PPE, everything was pretty professional. Mm. Sure. Um, were you going to say standard? <sighs> I was going <laughs> to... Standard... It's for these countries, it is. For what but I it's would, very would, different standards at home. <laughs> right. For Korea, it would be what you would say is standard. Right. But as soon as I got back into Dublin Airport, I was like, okay. <laughs> um, I saw one dude sitting with like a, a scanner ch- checking general body temperature as mm. we came through. But, uh, oh man, there was so many things that set me off. Red, <laughs> um, red flags popping and, up. Uh, I, I went straight to Twitter, which then ended up in me being on national radio the next day while incredibly jet lagged <laughs> being ah. asked questions about the the experience whatever and they tried to basically people twitter tried to turn it into a big scandal and mm. to blow it up and sure it went went that way what's well, funny because um, we, we know a few people now that have gone back or or even come back to korea and shown their treatment here with the packages and everything mm-hmm. else and it's gone viral in their home in their right. home countries but yeah, they seem to be doing something right here. I didn't get any care package when I came back. Actually. Really? I was, oh yeah, I, I meant to ask you that out. earlier. I saw someone else who was doing the quarantine at the same time, but I think they were just in a different part of the city, and it depended on the local district, right? Was right. the treatment <laughs> center was providing it, and right. I didn't get anything. Well, they gave me the thermometer and um, some <laughs> hand sanitizer. That'll taste good. <laughs> and um, a, a cleaning spray. But that was it. There was no, nothing in the way of food. Um, so what do they expect? I mean, I don't. I don't think people are eating just that care package for two weeks, anyways. Yeah, but yeah. in terms of food, what do you do for two weeks in quarantine? For me, I was. I mean, you know, I had the homeless app set up already, so I was able to just go uh, to got it delivered to my door. Um, that's the only way I shop, man. Yeah. I can't. I can't go in and listen to the bulgogi man. <laughs> bulgogi samjanan. Bulgogi samjanan. On a like, Sunday morning, on a... It's it's right beside my house. So I feel like I'm incredibly <laughs> lazy to order everything for delivery, but it's just so much easier. Just so much easier. <laughs> the last time I went into Homeplus, I had someone come up to me in the aisles while I was carrying a pretty full basket and try to talk to me about Jesus. So um, 
<laughs> in a home bus of all places. Like, it's probably the last place you'd expect it. Yeah. But, uh... I don't know. I've gotten them all over here. <laughs> How about when you when you went back home? What yeah. was the quarantine like there? Was it, uh, it was restricted or very... It, there was not you said really did... any regulation on it whatsoever. They're not chasing they, your phone. You're out they, for morning They took morning my phone walk. number. There was nothing else really about it honor system you filled out a piece of paper and you handed it to some dude through um a, it was a plexiglass screen but it had a bunch of holes in it so it didn't really make much sense but there's no tracing anything anyways right well they supposedly had a contact tracing system but the entire two weeks in quarantine um i was fortunate that my brother and my sister were coming back at the same time hmm. and their partner so we all stayed in uh, airbnb and one of our bro- one of our brothers drove up in well two of them drove a car each mm. to the airport left one of them for us so that uh, we could just take the car down um without using any um public transport um other than that we wouldn't have been able to so that must have been nice to have some company to yeah, quarantine yeah. with because i think some of these guys going by themselves whew, 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 that's a stiff sentence two weeks by if you do it properly uh, one of our other buddies andy there he was in winnipeg on his way up north to Ikalo. you might know andy on his way up north to teach in uh, Northwest Territories. Equal loot. And he said, I'm in, I'm, in, uh, I'm in quarantine here downtown at the, whatever it was, Hilton or whatever it was. Yeah. And he's taking pictures outside from the road. And I said, dude, yeah. what kind of quarantine is that? Because my understanding in Korea was that every time you stepped out for a cigarette mm. was a $500 fine. And you weren't allowed to open your door until they came with whatever it was they were giving you or delivering to you. Mm. So, I mean, I just thought, wow, the standards are so different of what is considered quarantine and, sure. and to really keep a hold of this thing. But yeah. that's the that's the difference between blowing up over a thousand cases and having 77 right. countrywide, right? Or, we, we or had, 90 um, or 80,000 in the States. Christ, yeah. We had, we had a really nice kind of farmhouse mm. and it had a bunch of empty fields all around it. So oh, beautiful. I actually was able to get out of the house and walk around without meeting anybody. It was pretty great there's a bunch of horses in the field in yeah. them. so like as i was walking through the field these like four so. kind of baby horses just walked up to me and surrounded me i was like what is going on should i be worrying about getting the horse sne- COVID or something yeah. but, um, you so. sneeze on a horse it just falls <laughs> in <your> her <laughs> oh, so man. that sounds like a pretty comfy quarantine it was, then. was real nice and then i did the complete opposite of that when i came back because <laughs> i was back in my own apartment and just not leaving but yeah. at least here i had internet that functioned <laughs> um, yeah. so um, you Making. know it really did like go into like a rabbit hole completely secluded and yeah. just existed online for two weeks <laughs> making small talk how, with how do you keep it together i mean i think I, I don't know i don't even want to try because i think i would go bananas but i mean just being restricted in the way that we were for like only going to the park every day with my kids yeah for for a week or two i mean nothing there still stuff was open or whatever but my actual movement and not going to the university was, and, and private classes had canceled. So it was still the society, whatever economy was still going on, but it was restricted in some ways. And I was starting to feel it. Yeah. And I, if you told me I couldn't leave the house, I go, oh, wow. Ooh, I don't See, know. I don't know. I found comfort in that, man. I, I found comfort I in just imagine doing it with kids. I think that would be really, really tough. Totally stuck inside with kids would blow. Yeah. Like the Chinese lockdown was, was full on. Yeah. Don't come out of your place. Mm. I mean, I don't know. I, I, I like that we have access to the farm. I can go to my in-laws and, and use the, like, we'd go farm, park, farm, park, farm, park. Mm-hmm. But I couldn't imagine just staying in, indoors or inside. I think of people in Canada, at least if you have a yard, I mean, you can you can sit outside. You can sit on the patio. I mean, it's a, it's a lot different. But being locked in an apartment in Asia. <laughs> I tend to go through phases of just staying at home for, for long periods of time. Mm. Anyway. Flip between being incredibly social and then just hermiting away so yeah. the the quarantine experience wasn't a completely unfamiliar thing mm. but i'd already had in march i think it was at the end of february the high one where i was working someone actually came in to that day i remember on the friday there was a lot of stress people were freaking out because the hospital right across the road had one uh, patient <laughs> and it was like still very early days yeah. it was like just a handful of people scattered around the city and people are like oh it's so close to us it's really mm. scary right something about it i actually went into a mega mart that's right there to get my lunch and i was in there just two hours after this person and oh. there's so many people in there you're yeah. kind of like oh you never really know so i just yeah. decided 
for myself, I'm going to stay home all weekend. Uh, and then we got a message on Monday uh, that Agwan has been closed down because someone who had COVID came in to do a job interview. Oh. <laughs> and this place that has about a thousand staff working in it. Yeah. Uh, everyone was just like shut down for yeah. the two weeks yeah. and stay home. But so I, I did two weeks kind of already yeah. in that way. I was able to go out and about, but mm. I didn't do but it too do, much. But do you think it being forced upon you or being voluntary and knowing that you can go out if you want mm -hmm. is a big difference mentally? Absolutely. I, I think for me... I, I, we, I stayed close to home, but I knew I could go or I can go for a drive if I want. But mm. if someone said you can't leave or what, your phone tracker, you know, if you're 10 meters outside of your designated building, the, the alarm's just, going off to the just center. leave your phone at home if you're going yeah, for a drive. Um, if it doesn't move yeah. for a certain amount of time, they Five send minutes, a minutes. notification <laughs> that you have to click, tap the notification to yeah. say that you are still yeah. there with All your the phone. Time. And that actually had a bit of a bug, so I used to get it like every five minutes. It was really annoying me, even yeah. though I was like holding it in my hand. Ah. Um, if you don't answer, then they call you. If you don't answer the call, then they yeah. send someone. What yeah. if you're taking a dump for 30 minutes or in the That's shower right. or something? You know, you'll learn it pretty quick. Move mm -hmm. your phone every 20 minutes or you're going to get harassed. So it's simple. Huh. And I don't think many people are more than more than 20 minutes without their phone in Korea. Yeah. <laughs> but but yeah, I think, it, I think having the option of or no, just knowing that I can go for a drive if I want. I can go here. Not necessarily doing it, but mm. knowing that you can be a lot different mental frame than you got to stay here and you're not allowed yeah. or, or you got to pay or whatever. So. Absolutely. Um, and I, I, I came back to Korea thinking like I'm going to come back. I'm going to have high speed internet again. I'm going to be able to do all of these things. I had a bunch of different projects that I was mentally psyching myself up like i'm going to just spend those two weeks being so productive i'm going to yeah, get everything yeah, yeah. done <laughs> and by the third day i'd given up on all of it because i just knew i wouldn't be mentally able to make it through those two weeks adding extra pressure in on top of what's already there and I, I, you'd see it a lot through social media and so on like you'll see people be like oh take advantage of this time make your album <laughs> write your novel like no take take care of yourself absolutely you yeah. know this dangerous uh pattern to mm. like try and like push on people the uh you mentioned you had or you quarantined with a brother and a sister yeah and you had two brothers drive up and one drop a car off you come from a large family pretty big you said six brothers and sisters i have five brothers one sister holy moly um there are now uh three <laughs> in-laws four nieces four nephews two nieces holy moly i think the clan is growing. Um, and yeah, there's just, if you include all like significant others and so on in, in the family in general, mm. like if we meet up for a family dinner, you're talking like 20 people around a table, maybe 21. Where do you fit in? I'm in the youngest. Line. The youngest? Yep. Some of my siblings have done some work. <laughs> my sister's got five kids. Wow. Um, so what we got five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. There's 11 grandkids. All together, so we're also Christ. a big group, but yeah, more fun in numbers, right? That's <laughs> a, no. <laughs> well, we did try to meet for a family dinner after after we'd all finished quarantine. In the end, uh, two of my brothers didn't make it because, like, my brother and my sister came back from the UK, and I, I'm back in Korea. It's the first time the whole family is in the country. Mm. Even at that, we had to like hire uh, or rent out a hotel. Uh, grand ballroom <laughs> yeah it's like a big like it would be like a conference center almost and just like have a very large um like mafia meeting style <laughs> table set up you know so we're like spread out yeah. around from each other but even at that even with some of the family missing we're still like a ridiculous amount of people yeah but it's great okay yeah. let's get into the the meat and potatoes here uh maybe start with angle if you is that an irish joke I was gonna say, man. It was like, oh, you're already, you're already <laughs> throwing out potato steps. Come on, we're only twenty minutes in. Maybe don't since remind it, him since of the famine. The start, or, or or maybe take me back a little bit before the start. What was your involvement in music and and stuff getting brought up in Ireland, mm -hmm. and how how maybe how did that lead to the start of Angle Magazine here? Um, what's the history of of your music experience? I think. I have to go right back to the very start, which is my family. So my dad would have been musically inclined that he'd sing in the church choir, but as well as that, for a number of years, he was involved in the scouts. And whenever they were at a campfire, he actually started writing songs for the scouts that oh. they still sing wow. on campsites today. Cool. No one knows who wrote them. They're just like part of the overall yeah. lore of 
the scouts, I guess. That's awesome. Then coming down, like, through all of my, all of the kids, we all play music of some form. And while my mum didn't play anything that I'm aware of, she was probably the biggest musical influence in the family. Mm. She was a teenager for the duration of the Beatles' existence. Oh, wow. So, you know, she's she's grown up in an Ireland where people are starting to wear mini skirts. People are starting, like, she had a motorbike. She mm. was, she was that kind of woman. Cool. Um, uh, and I didn't really appreciate it until many years later after leaving home, like just the education that I got just from being around the kitchen where like she was playing every, everything from the Beatles, Lion Cohen and Bruce Springsteen and Gordon Lightfoot all the way through to, I think recently she started getting into Passenger who, uh, not my thing, but, yeah, mm. but cool. She still like, she still pays attention to music. And yeah. then on my dad's side, it was a lot more like country Western. There was a lot of Willie Nelson. There was a yeah. lot of you know, Johnny Cash. Um, Oof. and as well, he, almost permanently would use um, like there was a classical radio station in Ireland as well mm. called Lyric FM so it would be like any anytime we're in the car driving somewhere that would be on so you kind of had a pretty all around mix then coming down through my brothers like the range of music that was in the house so one of my brothers <laughs> was all about electric guitar and he would play Jimi Hendrix and Rory Gallagher and Eric Clapton that side of things yeah. another was just all singer songwriter Tom Waits, Bob Dylan, yeah. Nick Cave, everything. Another brother was completely into, like, the, I guess the weird women of rock, like Tori Amos and Bjork and a bit of jazz here and there. You just had so everything. much different music around. And it was just, that was not unusual for me. That was just what I thought was normal. And then you right. meet people who didn't have that experience and I, I got really confused by it. I was like, you mean your family doesn't sit around at Christmas and just play music together? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's funny you say that variety. <clears throat> I remember our mid-teens, maybe, mid to late teens, sharing a bedroom with my two brothers. Mom and dad had bought a bigger place, and we had this huge room, and there was kind of three nooks, and we each had a bed in one of them. But depending on what time you went to bed, the first guy would set his radio up, and the three of us all had different radio stations. <laughs> and we liked the different morning guy or the evening guy or the or the music or whatever. Yeah. But brother, one guy would go to bed and turn his music on. The next guy would come, turn that one down a bit, turn mine up a bit. The next <laughs> guy would come a bit. But by the time, and if you wake up in the night, you turn yours back up. But by the time the morning come around, mm. you get three radios blasting three different stations. <laughs> <laughs> but we were the same. I want to listen to country tonight. And yeah. he wants to listen to pop and he wants, you know, some, some hip hop or something. Wow. And it, it, that was funny. The radio is always the radio wars we'd have. Man. Turn yours down. No, turn yours down. No, <laughs> go to sleep. <laughs> I turn mine up. But yeah, it, it, it's fun how that can influence you. Like I remember at the age of eight, I was listening to Nirvana and Green Day. Then when I was about 10, I think maybe I was huge into Michael Jackson. That alone is a bit of a leap. But by the time I was 15 or 16, I was basically an old man. I only listened to Tom Waits, and <laughs> Leonard Cohen, <laughs> Bob Dylan, and Neil Young, and Nick Cave. It was like, I swear, I was like, I'm 15 and I'm listening to music like I'm 65. Yeah. That was something uh, there. Um, then coming through uni, that was also pretty formative in that. I went to university in Cork. There was a club night there called Freak Scene, which had... The freaky scenes? Pretty much, yeah. It was it was like a two-floor club. And on the upstairs, you would have anything at all. Like, if you came in early, like, for the first half an hour, you could request any song you wanted, and it would be played as long as you danced to it. It didn't mm. matter if there's only two people dancing. The person who asked for it, you go and you dance. And so, like, you'd have people coming in requesting Hurt by Johnny Cash and going out and dancing to it. I was like, this is... Like what you want to hear in a club, okay? Mm. But cool, go for it. That um, uh, Nine Inch Nails, Johnny Cash, or the the cover that's uh, that's okay in your books. Oh well, I think he actually improves them. So absolutely, yeah. It's um, it that, depends on how you approach a cover. You even know? the yeah, you know, we'll we'll get into that after. But All right. even watching <laughs> watching that video, you're mm. like, wow, this is it's it was almost written for it was it almost is, written for him. Yeah. Yeah. You were mentioning that you all played different instruments yeah. or some kind of. Was that, did you go to paid lessons or was that, I mean, there was no YouTube probably no, then for right. teaching yourself. And if you're paying for seven kids to go to music lessons, I mean, that's, that's not cheap, man. No, no <laughs> were you guys not. teaching each other or were you, we were, how were you learning? We were pretty fortunate. We were all given Just pretty though. decent lessons. Um, being the youngest, I probably had the least amount of time to practice. <laughs> um, especially because we only had one piano in the house. So I started off on piano and I did graded lessons on that. But the approach I took to piano kind of became the approach I took to everything in life, which was completely ignored and forget about it until about a day before the exam when I panicked. <laughs> and I just completely 
Last were you, were you doing like crash. Royal Conservatory music? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I was doing. And I think Academy of I think that's whatever. what really turned me off. There was we used to babysit kids in the morning before school. Mm. Their parents would drop them off. We'd take care of them for half an hour, and then we'd all go to school together. And she would sit there. I remember one Leilani Sutterfield. She'd sit around on the piano and play. Hey, can you play this song? Sure. And I was like, wow. And I'm playing some Beethoven thing yeah. that I never cared for. <laughs> and I got a test coming up next week, right. and I was like, Mom, I want to play like her. Mm-hmm. Can you play the new Spice Girl? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Anything. She could hear. She could just play. And I would love to do that. So recently, during Corona, when it started in March, I downloaded the app. I want to say Joy Tunes. And it's on an iPad. And I started playing. And it started coming back really quick. Nice. But now it's all pop music. It's such a different way of learning it. Mm-hmm. And I thought, why didn't I do this from the beginning? I and think... I'm sure there was reason. But, man. But it's good. I would never put my kids in conservatory music. Right, I think it's good to have that that base in conservatory music. It right? is important I, to get like that technical grounding first. That if you can get the basics from that, and you can get the ear, mm. that's how you get to the point where you can listen to a song and go and play it. That's the I've seen one of my one of my middle school students, or he's in uni now, but um, he grew up playing all that Beethoven and mm. and well, what do you call it? The I class, the class stuff. It's Classical. practicing scales and all, and all this mm. stuff and going for the tests. And... But he was, dude, he was unreal. And it was, I was pushing like, dude, write your own music. Oh, I don't know how, I don't know how. Do it, start doing something. And now he's, man, he's composing his own uh, his own stuff. But awesome. I think it's because he has that, uh, he has that solid base in, yeah. in, uh, in the classics, I guess you'd call. So do you still play now or? Um, I... Listen, yeah, I, I asked him that earlier. He said, oh, I don't know, I'm not, I'm not that good. But he's he's comparing himself to everyone else. Right. I mean, I, you know, growing up in a musical family where you, you're surrounded by highly talented people, mm. um, I never reached the point of mastery on any particular instrument. I did. I ended up getting very frustrated with the piano because, well, obviously I wasn't practicing, mm. so I wasn't making any progress. <laughs> um, but then I switched up to percussion for, uh, it was only for three years. We just had a teacher in the city for a short amount of time. Mm. And that ended up bringing me into like a youth orchestra. Um, so I did play percussion from like the triangle mm. to the like big kettle drums and everything, which was it. Like if you'd seen me at 14 years of age, I was much smaller than I am right now. Mm. Uh, and I was having to lift these kettle drums up over my head <laughs> to wade my way through like a sea of violin players who were all freaking out that there was this massive kettle drum thing, like <laughs> twice the size of me just like looming over the place but yeah I came out of that then and moved into there's a performance art group a performance arts group in Galway called Machnus I started drumming with them and it's a completely different experience and I mean if you've seen a parade where there's a marching band and they're all very rigid Mm. and just like everything's perfectly controlled Machnus is the complete polar opposite of that you wear fancy crazy costumes um, like you might have makeup that has you like a like a burn victim your face is melted with blood mm. dripping off your face and you're dancing down <laughs> like you are dancing yeah, down yeah. The street have you have you seen down. a local group that does that in where in, in here in Ulsan they're um, usually at a lot of the festivals these guys play and do you, do you know who I'm talking about which ones they're wild and crazy they're the same thing they're hip no but they don't dance. have like melting Not faces melting. no but they, they're, the they're dancing group? and the what the salsa group is it like they're like they're going to uh, no, it's more like a. They have costumes. I thought it was like a Japanese influence. It kind of could be, but I mean, yeah. they're not that rigid mm-hmm. marching band American football NCAA game. football game stuff. Okay. Um, but no, they're. I think, and they're they're so awesome. I think they have so much fun, and they come out and they're like they're not in any formation or anything. They're always kind of really loose and relaxed, and I think that looks like such a fun group to be a part of. Because it's so much less structured. 100%. But but they look like they have tons of fun. Oh, and that's kind of what they are. Yeah. It's a lot. It's so much fun. I I loved every minute of that to the point that I started it in, in Ireland. Secondary school is six years. So in my fourth year until my sixth year, the fifth and the sixth year are kind of like the final, uh, similar to in Korea, like your final exam determines what you can do for university and everything mm, else. Right. I, I just joined all of the parades and everything that I could for mm. that group during that time and uh, in my final year they announced they were performing for the opening ceremony of the special olympics which was held in ireland that year yeah so it's going to be performing in a stadium in front of eighty thousand people and it's going to be broadcast live on tv Unreal. and you'd have to rehearse like twice a week for however many weeks in the lead up to it yeah and i was like yeah i'm doing that so 
studied it in uh, Kosovo well for my final couple of years. Um, Absolutely, but you um, made a you made a memory that lasted a lifetime. You man, said you yeah. you bumped into. I mean, right after graduation, you met or not met, but were rubbing rubbing uh, shoulders, rubbing elbows, rubbing elbows. Yeah. Who oh, rub? I, what, I, what do you I, rub? I, what do you rub when you meet people? Depends rubbing on elbows. Are, yeah. You know? um, I mean, it was. I finished my last exam on a Thursday, yeah. and I was on a bus that day, and yeah. the performance was a Saturday. So I mean. While most of my friends were in the field just getting drunk in the rain, yeah. um, I was on stage being introduced by Arnold Schwarzenegger. Yeah. Um, well, admittedly, it wasn't just me. It was like 120 people. Right. You know, but Philip Brett and, and <laughs> these other people with drama. I, I, think, I think you said Ali was there and Mandela and yeah. all kinds of people. Oh, things. man. Yeah, it was, it was amazing. Nelson Mandela, Muhammad Ali. I'm just curious. Did you know anything about the Special Olympics? I knew a bit, yeah. When I was in fourth year, transition year, we started doing... That's like where you do a lot of community outreach. So right. mm-hmm. um, one of the things I was doing that year was doing uh, art classes for students from the local school for cool. uh, people with disabilities. Um, so we were doing, there was a group of us, we were just doing like one-to-one art classes. Um, cool. And from that, like met a number of people who also were involved in sports. Because and... I, I used to coach Special Olympics in Manitoba. Wow. And that was maybe five or six years maybe. And oh, I just love working with those kids. Mm-hmm. Um, and I remember going to provincial track meets and stuff kid could get 12th place everybody gets a ribbon he come run up the stairs coach 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 happiest guy and, and, and sometimes I, I envy that you know they they don't maybe they can't perceive what's going on all the all the bullshit that's going on in society and man it, mu- it must be a lot simpler or easier in a lot of times mm-hmm. than than what a lot of other people have to or are, are, are going through as well mm-hmm. but I didn't know there was was that a world I'm sorry. Was that a was that a, like a world Special Olympics? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, like I didn't even I didn't even know there was anything outside of nationals because there's so much controversy over where they are on the spectrum and and how their their rating like so there was a lot of sandbagging when we used to go to provincials. You have to submit your your best times and they put you in groupings, but guys submit times ten seconds slower to get in the easier grouping mm-hmm. and then they win it and now they can go to nationals. Wow. Okay. Oh. And 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 I was like whoa, this is a new look. And that's one of the things that made me want to get out of there was mm-hmm. I couldn't believe the same politics were in Special Olympics as they were in our local hockey leagues and football leagues and whatever. It blew my mind. The Special Olympics itself is kind of, it follows the same format of the Olympics is in it's every four years and they'll move it from place to place. So mm-hmm. that year, fortunately, was Ireland. But it's, it was one of those things where you kind of wish that there had if it had just been like a couple of years later, you would have had all these things like smartphones and social media and so mm, on, yeah. and it would have probably been documented a little bit better. There's an old VHS tape somewhere in my house that has like footage from it. Yeah. But that's not going to look so great anymore. You know, yeah. it doesn't really have the same thing. I had a disposable camera. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so I've got a lot of like really dodgy photos from during a dress rehearsal where I was just, once I finished my side it's of things, I came blurry. Back, like to the front of the stage. <laughs> And like, I'm taking photos, I like, look, there's you too, man, there's my <laughs> okay. And all you see is like the person sitting in front of me kind of flash hits the back of their head and then there's like a shadowy stage yeah. over and you're just like, yeah. Oh man. Things kids these days will never understand. Yeah. You know. <laughs> that with that being said, and being heavily involved in the music scene and, and whatnot, how do you feel when you see uh, someone at one of your live shows just either totally involved in their in their phone not watching the music or watching the music through their phone and just so I, I don't know it, it bothers me that people aren't just the experience the, the, just the experience isn't good enough anymore it's I have to capture this song or I have to capture this f- fucking fireworks display because at some point in the future it's going to be the the most amazing thing that I that I have to look back on and probably you never go back and watch those Yo, here's here's fireworks, August August seventh, two thousand sixteen. Oh, what a magical night! What's your what's your feelings on that being the? Mm, when it comes to a live show or live music, everyone enjoys stuff in a different way. Yeah. So if they're listening and they don't feel the need to watch it, but yeah. they're still listening and they're able to appreciate it from that, great. You know what? Um, as well, if they've paid to come into the show, also. They can do whatever they from want. A, from a promoter's perspective and from the band's perspective, <laughs> great. Yeah, yeah. You know? Absolutely. Um, ideally, sure, you want everyone engaged. That's... Um, Subjective. It's up to, that, yeah, the, up way to people the person. The enjoy yeah. is different. Um, and there will always be people as well who are trying to document it because 
maybe they're trying to do something like creating their own uh, platform of documenting what's happening in the scene. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so cool. That also is a thing. Like I have taken out my phone, and from the perspective of the like the platform of promotion, that's a part of it now. Mm, uh, yeah. There's no escaping it. it, it it's you can't uh, put the, the plug back in after. You can't. Why aren't um, these coffees working yet? <laughs> I, yeah, I, I, I got a couple other things that are coming to mind, but they're not suitable for putting on a mic. Um, <laughs> I, I remember the days where, where the the handphones were just coming out, and they would check you and say no handphones at the concert. Oh, wow. No, you don't remember any of those? No. Um. I mean, well. You remember your, you know? Well, but I remember I security school. guards, yeah. or you take out your camera at the performance. And say, hey, put your cameras away. For you. uh, Everyone's always can't put the lid back on the can. Something like that, isn't that? Uh, it's gonna bug me. Open the can't put the worms back in the can. I don't know. Can't unring the bell. <laughs> but yeah. uh, but now you know it's not even worth trying. Right. The whole place has it, no matter yeah. what. Everybody's because before we were getting bootleg copies mm, sent out before it was right. actually, and, and it was you know a lot of maybe infringement or, or rights things, but now it's just a free for all. Everybody do it, and now I think it's kind of like free advertising, right? Yeah, it is. This concert numbers. was awesome. Go check it out. Yeah. And I think that's what a lot of people, although the, the videos usually don't do them justice, mm -hmm. when you're in the moment, you're like, I wish my parents, I wish my friends could see this, you know, how wild and crazy it is or, or get the 80,000 people in the stadium. Sure. But but even capturing it on the video doesn't, they just, right, it doesn't do any justice. But that's, I mean, I'll contrast the, you know, seeing uh, Paul McCartney in, in Seoul where, I mean, he's playing... Uh, whatever tune it is and everyone's just you know they just got their their phones up and they're they're just viewing it totally through the screen i'm like no enjoy i took a couple of pictures but it's funny when we saw walking after you i i had to take a video of that that was too i've never seen four korean girls rock so hard and, <laughs> and she's whipping her guitar around you know that was uh, uh, i remember posting it to the our cacao group and going boys you gotta these girls are wild you gotta go check these guys out i mean you never seen anything like this in korea and without that, I mean, you can, okay, like, spinning the guitar around and, like, the head banging. They're wild. So, yeah, the next time Marky Jet, we all went out and watched him again. Great, yeah. But, I, I almost went home that night. He told me, like, no, no, just wait, just wait, just wait. <laughs> we went and said hi to him, and then they played. That was awesome. Man. So you were part of three bands. One of them, I'm going to say, doesn't really count anymore. It was just <laughs> like, me messing around with a computer. You know, it yeah, wasn't yeah. really bad. But, yeah, two that gigged and performed and did a certain amount of... What what were you Stuff. what did you take out of those experiences? Any inspirations or any anything that still applies to your life today? Or um, the main thing I think that I got from it was more usually I was the organizer more than the like star attraction. Mm. Uh, <laughs> musically was never like mind blowingly great at anything, so I would take like in the first band I would mix between some keyboards or just like rhythm guitar. Um, and I would write the songs, but I would have someone else for singing or someone else to do like the, the lead uh, guitar moments or like the, the hooks of the mm. songs. Um, and then in the second band as well in London, that was a very similar setup where I would have done a lot of the songwriting to a point and then we would have evolved that from there. Um, like I would write the lyrics or like the bass of a melody mm. and uh, uh, produce it together from there on. Cool. Um, bringing in bass and guitar. and So you got the music inside you, just hard to... Hard to make your fingers yeah, work in. Uh... Yeah, I, I I would have a lot of. You could almost compare it to like someone who is still learning a language but hasn't quite got the words together to put a sentence out to like express what yeah. they're trying to say in much the same way musically that I didn't have the skills to really bring something out as much as I would want to. But um, I think that was probably my first taste of being an organizer, like and being yeah. behind the scenes, and I didn't really understand that until like much later when i started doing things again while here i uh, started organizing events and so on and so you just like you just woke up one day and said eh, i'm in south korea i don't see much live music <laughs> you know what i'm just gonna start promoting or um, i'm gonna start uh, i'm gonna start firing up some some local shows what was the the lead up to your first event it's were you doing that before the magazine or did that come I after think so. i think it came after um oh the magazine was my Before the shows, first, ah, yeah. okay, okay. Pretty sure. I I honestly was so surprised when I came to Wilson because, like, Galway has like a population of seventy thousand people. <laughs> Take my hometown, yeah. And there was music shows every single night, multiple venues. Yeah. Right. You could go anywhere and see something. Now, 
a lot of it were cover bands. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, which probably leads up to me not enjoying that as much as uh, so as others do. But coming here and not being able to find, I couldn't find it. Mm. Now, now I know that a lot of that was language barrier. Mm. A lot of that was kind of naivety or just being ignorant of stuff. Mm. Um, but I mean, what's thrown in your face here when you when you come? It's K-pop. Oh yeah. Top to top yeah. to bottom everywhere you go. But once I did find, once I started to find bands, and once mm. I started to get to shows and figure that out, I was all in. I was like, yeah, okay, I want to, I want to get that. So myself and Joshua Hanlon started the magazine together, and we planned. Initially, it was only talking about covering Wulsan, and the idea was, oh, like, I could give the example that there was there were some people here who used to say things like, "I am a writer." <laughs> but they never wrote anything yeah. and they never published anything so it was like how are you calling yourself a writer so the idea was just let, let's provide a space where maybe it could be something people would aspire to that okay if I write something yeah if you build it, it they will come there yeah. um, and so it, it wasn't only it. music in the beginning oh it's it's always been um, a mixture of art, art and yeah. music and literary stuff yeah. so the whole spectrum yeah let's say um and Josh initially was the the literary side of that. And when he left, Sean O'Gorman took over as a literary editor. Mm. Then the art and the music, I guess, was more from my, my background too. Mm. Um, like art is also in the family. My dad was the first of a long line of his dad and his dad and his dad. Mm. They were all called Thomas Brett, all of them. And they were all painters of some form. No, so like one of them was the guy who painted the local church, was the it? actual building. And then there was someone who painted the church in like... A nice landscape painting. Oh. So, we, like, there's one in the library in my dad's hometown. That's like one of his great, great whatever is hanging in the library. Wow. And we have a painting in our house from early 1800s, like before the famine in Ireland, painted by one of our uh, ancestors. So, yes, that's the word. So that's also there's like the artistic element is there too. I uh, tangent off a lot, so I'm trying to remember oh, what I'm getting back to here. I'm oh, just, to just the original angle of starting and okay, where, right. where it came from. Yeah, just once that started, having the site actually then attracted people to get in touch as well. So we started finding things in Daegu and we started finding things in Busan. So, okay, we spread out more. The The great thing about the site was that we didn't start it as experts. We didn't start it as right. claiming to know anything. It was purely, this is almost for ourselves as much as it is for the people who are reading. Yeah. And we're just trying to find what was there. And then over the years, it's just been able to keep growing to mm. where wherever it is now was there ever a point where you said we're only going to focus on the south yeah pretty much from and if so why the main reason was how should i say this i guess the bleed of the local scenes towards seoul from the very first day i arrived in wilson people were telling me oh if you want any of that you got to go to seoul to find it and you would i would meet students in my schools who were saying i'm going to go to seoul because i want to be a musician or I want to do this and I have to go there to mm. do it so I would much rather focus on a local scene and help to develop that and help to grow that I mean yes. I could guess Seoul and Gyeonggi are, are well covered and have, mm. have lots of that but what about the Gangwondos and some of the northern regions that aren't big metropolises would you do you guys also cover that or just For, or just Gwangju yeah Ulsan, Busan, Poang, Daegu like it Angle has evolved and changed so many times over the years that it was initially Ulsan then it became Ulsan, Busan, Daegu then it became covering the south and we spread over towards Gwangju and then over the last year or so just said kind of said fuck it and um, anything co that's covering, not Seoul <laughs> well even now I'm including Seoul um, yeah. yeah just covering the whole country because cool. as well it had been bilingual uh, and now it's just for the time being mm. just down to circumstances and who is still involved or just only going to use English. At the time that it started, there wasn't as much that was covering things happening in the South. Mm. So having that in both languages was quite important. But over the years, people have started paying more attention. And now you will find in most like national publications, you will find articles where you, like bands from Busan or from Daegu are getting much more success and coverage. It's not necessary for Engel. To have that anymore so now i'm going to focus it on being just an english language publication and try to bring it more to international attention mm. um because i think there are, are more and more groups coming up from like in daegu there's a group called big nine global club there is someone in busan whose tag i think it's just called busan indie and they do their local scenes mm. so and that's it's primary that's to korean audience so again 
each local scene is starting to get someone who's there to document yep. stuff that maybe didn't happen as much before. So now, again, we can shift our uh, Focus, perspective yeah. to be more internationally. That's awesome. Do you find <clears throat> a lot of the a lot of the local bands their dream is making it big, or would you say they're they're more of like uh, weekend warriors? We have for where I'm from, there's a lot of local bands who I don't know if it they it's just that they haven't made it big, but they make uh, <laughs> no no. But they, I mean, there's a lot of there's a, there's a good no. They're they're very talented guys. They got original music. And a lot of them, oh shit, a lot of them just play the the local local bars or whatever. And they, I mean, they have regular jobs. But yeah. um, what's the? You interact lots with the with the bands here. Do they all have dreams of 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 making it big, or are they just happy playing their music, getting it out there? I think it's the same with any scene that you will have people <clears throat> who want to just mm. do it to be famous. Okay. You'll have people who want to make the stuff they want to make and hopefully be able to have a career out of it. And then you'll have the people who just are doing it for fun. And that's how you get such a, a spread of the people who go for a highly commercialized and polished approach. They are the ones who just want the fame and want the success. The guitar swingers. <laughs> <laughs> um, Those guys are all original, man. Yeah. No, they're awesome. They're they're a manufactured band. Did you know? Oh uh, no. He he dropped the he dropped the bomb on it on uh, during lunch there. Oh yeah. uh, well, uh, just from what I read on a Wikipedia article, mm. um, that band uh, were formed from a TV show competition where two bands who had both competed were merged together into one. Huh. So much for organic. No, they're still no, but they still they put on a good but show. But to keep going have, and to be yeah. going around the country touring, I mean, you got to have. If you're not into it, you're not into it. I mean, oh for sure. They especially in Korea. I mean, they and. I don't know. I don't know. I Call they're... me a traditionalist. I like the I like the guys who played in the played in the garage. I still think it's really important that they are doing that because, for example, like you guys have been to their shows and you enjoyed it, and Absolutely. it's given you a taste of something that you might not have found otherwise. Exactly. So I told Chili, tell me when they're in town because that's the only <laughs> yeah. nights I go out. And you know, it's once every three months or four months. And if I'm going out, I mean, you won't be able to hear the next day, but but that's a night that I enjoy going out and watching them rock yeah. they're, they're good there, there are so many amazing um like if it doesn't like the gender is not so relevant but in korea there are noticeably more and more female acts coming through right now as well no um way. so one of my personal favorites well there actually there are two bands that i love to see uh just go completely wild on mm. stage one is a daegu band called drinking boys and girls choir who I brought two sticky fingers back in. I'm going to say 2014 or 15. Um, and they're a skate punk band, and they go absolutely nuts. <laughs> um, the drummer is just a constant animal from the Muppets. I don't even, yeah, I, yeah. I don't have the words for. Her. She's spectacular. Um, you'll just hear, hear like the kick drum going, dun, 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 like, uh, like the driving energy of the band. Yeah. Um, the bassist Mina just does not give a shit about her bass. Like she jumps all over the place. Um, at the end of almost every set, it's like, okay, you, you were talked, we talked earlier before recording about Prince throwing his guitar up into the air yeah. after that performance. She throws her bass up into the air, but you know where it's landing. It's landing smack down on the stage and yeah. just like smashing the crap out of it. Um, <laughs> but she's also get running out into the crowd because mm. uh, she just uses like a, a wireless uh, connection to the amp. Yeah. And she jumps into the crowd and gets right up in your face and is playing the bass for like right. Oh, pushes that, through everything. That's one thing that attracted me to that girl group, the Walking, walking After You, is that right? Mm -hmm. Because... I've never seen that kind of confidence exuded in, in females in Korea. Mm -hmm. And that kind of, I run the show. Look at me. Yeah. I'm in charge here. Mm -hmm. And I thought, wow, these ladies are bosses, man. They're just owning it. And I was like, that confidence was just attractive. Like, that, you, never, you, never, you never see that. So it was really appealing. And that's what makes me go back to mm -hmm. see them saying, hey, I like, so we joked one time. I said, I wonder who they date. Like, what kind of. Korean guy, or or like what they're like outside off the stage because man I don't think the average Korean dude would be like so scared of them like holy what do you do in your free time oh, I just play the guitar well you never seen this before mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I think they would be found very intimidating by by the typical Korean man there is a great band as well from Seoul called Billy Carter 
And they started out as a two-piece, so two women who were traveling to London together to live for a year, so they just wanted to make some extra money by busking. And Gina is an incredible guitar player. She was from Busan originally, and mm. the singer Jiwon has got one of, hands down, the best voices you will hear. Mm. Um, and they started playing together. Later, then they came back to Seoul. They added in a drummer, and it's evolved over the years, yeah. and they've now just become a four-piece and released an album last month called Don't Push Me. Mm. And that album when you listen to it it physically assaults your ears yeah <laughs> it's like lyrically just straight in there um like the i think the third song on the album is called beat up mm. and the chorus is i got beat up by so many men mm. uh, just repeated over and over and like uh, examples of all of the time in korean society where it's considered acceptable for men to just hit women yeah on like battling back against misogyny or like another song like my body my choice and, mm. um being against the uh, abortion laws in korea and so yeah. on and Oh, it's just again their Powerful. their Powerful. live show too mm. is just in your face yeah. mm. and don't don't take any bullshit from anyone. I love them. I love them to bits. That's awesome. But, uh, what constitutes a good venue for you? I mean, we we see them at uh, we watch live music at Sticky Fingers mm-hmm. or Royal Anchor. They got a sure. little smaller stage there. What uh, what's important, or what do you think makes for a good gig? The most important thing for me is probably different to what a band will want. Band want good sound, mm. and they want <laughs> good acoustics. You know, yeah, you know, they want to have people who people. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> um, for me, I want a venue that encourages people to participate. So, for example, if you've got a stage that's significantly higher off the ground and a barrier in between, there's such a division between the performer and the audience that it just creates a dis- there's a disconnect. So things like Sticky Fingers and Royal Anchor, I love that they are places where you can get right up in some yeah. space. So, for example, when Big Day South was held in uh, Royal Anchor in 2015, one band, Say Sumi, were playing, and the audience had seen them a couple of times at that point. They'd come to, this is maybe like their fourth or fifth show in Ulsan, hmm. and the audience just came up onto the stage. And there is there is a wooden barrier there um, in Royal Anchor. There is not much space to get onto the stage, but there was just such demand. People just pushed through, yeah. surrounded the band, dancing on the stage, stage invasion. Great. The band loved it. crowd loved it. Everyone was happy. Ideally, as a promoter, I want to make a show that is cheap enough that a lot of people will come, mm. but still have enough money coming out of it to pay all the bands. Mm. That is kind of the ideal situation. A lot of promoters don't want to risk losing money, so they're going to charge higher fees. There's actually not so many straight up promoters, too. Most shows are either organized by the bands or the venues or a label themselves. Mm. There are a couple of promoters around who do some really good stuff. There's a guy from the UK called Patrick Connor who set up uh, Do Indie with his partner, Doyen, and they kept that running for a while. Uh, they've since kind of pivoted into promoting international shows primarily, yep. and they brought over a lot of acts from around Asia. Mm. Um, they were involved in the Busan International Rock Festival the other year, and they yep. brought over the Chemical Brothers and Courtney Barnett. So they've been doing really, really good stuff, and they are what I would call promoters mm. like straight up they are they are professional they're great um i do small shows in, <laughs> in have you done accounts. any international stuff um i've mm. done a handful um how does it work it's hard it depends on whether you want to do it properly or not and like properly i guess like legally mm. correct um there was one show where i brought over say francis the um, u.s rapper he was doing shows in Japan and in New Zealand as part of his world tour. Mm. It was just that kind of gap of time in between. Yeah. Another person I know just sent him a tweet like, hey, how about coming to Korea? And they're like, well, if you know anyone who'll put on a show, so just put that together. We agreed to set fee and made a show in Daegu and a show in Busan. Mm. Uh, the Daegu show was a complete bomb and this was his first impression of Korea. He was playing <laughs> to seven people oh. um, and the next morning you just see him being like, huh, okay, let's see how today goes. And mm. by the end of the show in Busan, audience was packed and I had sold all of the merch that he brought with him to Korea. Beautiful. So we, he made his money. Um, I took a bit of a loss on that show, mm. but it would have been the same loss as if I had spent the same money going to see him playing in Seoul because of the cost of train ticket up and down, yeah, right? yeah. cost of accommodation, cost of the ticket, all of that stuff. So for the same amount of money, I got to see him play two times and hang out with him for the day. So And, know, and a great cool. experience for sure. going forward. Yeah. Um, I ended up bringing him back a couple of years later for like his duo, Epic Beardman, him and B. Dolan. 
they came back and they played in Busan and they played in Seoul. And for that event, I worked with Patrick who, and Doyen, who I mentioned earlier. Uh, as well, they've been a lot of the shows that they have brought over. Mm. Uh, the, sorry, not the shows. A lot of the international bands that they've brought over who have played in Seoul. We've worked together to come bring some of them down into Busan or to other cities. Cool. Uh, myself and another guy who has left Busan called Steve mm. Chang, who was a really good promoter in Busan for a few years. Is there any uh, anyone sending Korean bands abroad? Oh, for sure. Yeah. yeah, there I is. There, Japan would be quite common. Probably one of the harder ones to go to. Yeah, um, there's probably a sweet scene in Japan, no? There I would is, but the Japanese live scene is run by live halls, where you you have to rent out the venue, um, mm. and you're paying just have for a set amount of time. A lot of overhead. And there's other kind of restrictions. I'm not completely sure on all of the specifics, but I know there's still some regulation about dancing that certain, certain <laughs> aren't allowed to have dancing after a set amount after a certain hour um, i'm not sure if that law is still in operation <laughs> or not but that's wild well, where it, would uh, it can be quite tough to make shows in japan so where would a korean band typically go a lot of them want to get to america right. that's not what's happened but in recent years the most successful has been to the uk mm. so there's a couple of festivals in the uk who have been coming over um so there's liverpool sound city there's Focus Wales. Uh, both of them will come over and see Korean bands mm. and then invite them to come over and play. And then when they get the funding to go for those festivals, they can arrange a tour around that. So you've also had Korean bands go to things like Primavera Pro, South by Southwest in the mm. States, uh, the Great Escape Festival in Brighton. Mm. Are they are they only looking for English artists or English Korean or, I mean, the Korean? Only in terms of language? Yeah. Uh, it doesn't Does it matter? matter or... No. no? Um, it's, it's just, the, is the band good or not? Is it going to work with the audience in that market? Hmm. So a lot of bands get those set shows set up. Hmm. That gets them access to government funding to pay for their flights and transport over to that. Uh, so it's a government. I remember Sean O'Gorman telling me about in Canada, they had a, a fund or something that they would pay the spoken word mm -hmm. artists to go abroad and, sp and speak their word, I guess. <laughs> um and no, that I, I had no idea that was uh, that was available. But that's yeah. here too. They send their they they would apply for a government fund. We're going to this festival or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Huh. Um, if government funding is notoriously tough to get hold of, um, so I'll, it generally will be people who run a label will be very very good at getting that funding. Mm. It's kind of the advantage of going okay. for a label here. Okay. But then as well, you've got like the, the band I mentioned earlier, Drink Boys and Girls Choir. Um, they were the headliner for Big Day South in 2018. Mm. During that performance, someone posted a video of them on Instagram that got spotted by the UK label Damnably, mm. who then reached out and signed them. And Jeez. after, well, that's the second Korean band they've signed. They'd already signed Say Soon Me before that from Busan. Mm. Um, after that, uh, Drink Boys and Girls Choir were booked for a tour around the UK. Mm. Um, that's it, right? Once you once you you make that connection, the pipeline opens up and yeah. and it starts to flow for sure. I mean, I could go on at length about that, but mm. uh. <laughs> does, does the I, I wrote down to ask you a lot of the stuff you review or you promote mm -hmm. on AMP is Korean groups, Korean bands. What is the ratio of Koreans to to English speaking expat bands or whatever? Not so many expat bands get to a point where they've written enough songs to record something right. put it out there. So maybe. The ninety percent Korean? I would say ninety eight percent Korean. Ninety eight. Okay. So when it's ninety eight percent Korean, I've, I've had one. Think, <laughs> I've had one. I think, I, think, I, think, I think a lot of people mm. are turned off by music that's just not in their language for for whatever reasons. I, okay. I think many people. You know, once in a while you get Macarena or, or Ricky Martin there, Living La Vida Loca or Despacito. <laughs> but other than that, there's not. I mean, in the general society, I think most people listen to music in their language. A lot of the stuff you're promoting and, and on your on AMP mm. is Korean. Uh, what do you say or what would you say to people who are hesitant to listen to music in other languages? Well, it depends. Um, are we talking about people specifically in Korea? or uh, Anywhere, in I think. Okay. I mean, ob obviously, yeah, in Korea it's probably English and, and, and Korean, but I also know some Koreans who listen to French music. In North America it's probably a, a lot more diverse, but still probably mostly confined to Spanish, English, maybe French in Canada. But, I mean, a lot of the stuff you probably don't understand, right? Um, I w would understand 
it depends on how much slang they're using or you know like local dialect um but if you don't follow if you don't follow the scene i mean for someone who doesn't follow the scene Mm -hmm. they don't understand the words so where do you i mean what would you say to people who are maybe first time experiencing korean music say well when i was first finding bands i wouldn't have understood lyrics either but for me it was the performance of the band themselves the energy they had on the stage, the music that they were making. Lyrics are just a like one part of the band many band. instruments that are happening. But if there's no show to go to, mm-hmm. and you're just listening, hey, have a listen to these guys. See, that they're playing tonight. Let's go see them. Uh, I, don't, I, it's, I don't know if that's my style. Oh, they got a wicked show, though. Mm. I mean, if I didn't see the video of the of the girls, or, or if I didn't if I didn't come across them one time by accident. I would have known, but that's why I took the video because if the guys see this, mm-hmm. they'll want to go and watch that band because these guys are the real deal. Sure. Mm-hmm. But without a video, if they're just listening on the podcast or something mm-hmm. without the video, is it the same? I think everyone has different approaches to music. Sure. So you'll have people who live for live shows. You'll have people who are pretty, like like they have a pretty, like let's say, established record collection. Or maybe you just have people who are casual listeners who just want to put on the radio. Mm. I have something in the background. Everyone has a different approach to that. In general, the people who have, let's say, who I've met who have gone headlong into the Korean music scene, they're doing it out of love for music first. Right. You know, no matter where they are, they're going to be seeking out those scenes and they're going to be trying to get in, get to shows. Like, I mean, you with hockey, right? If a music enthusiast comes there, they're looking for live shows. You said first thing you do when you go home or go to a new place is seek out the seek out the hockey team. <clears throat> it's probably similar. Yeah. So. Um, one one interesting thing that I heard. I don't know if I read it or, or heard it about the DIY DIY tour versus the the luxury versus the luxury uh, luxury tour. What's a mindset of of uh, Korean indie band or does it? If if you had to make a generalization, would uh, would you say they're more they they want that luxurious tour? Is anyone getting a van and driving around Korea trying to find gigs? Some people, there are some bands who do <clears throat> their like independent shows. Yeah. Primarily, when it comes to playing in other cities, it comes one of two ways. One is the local culture center or some planner who has access to funding. Okay. Thinks, oh, I'm going to book this band from Seoul. I need lots of money, and reaches out and books one band and promises them all of the money. Yeah. And they'll come and get the lion like, share. Yeah everything the full, okay. the full treatment and feel like complete rock stars despite okay. maybe not even having <laughs> a record out yet or whatever okay, okay. then on the other side of it you just have bands who know each other and are friends hmm. and they'll make a show just to play together for fun and they'll come and they'll sleep in each other's like apartment or something like that that one doesn't happen as often in the past i have tried to book bands to play like i've, I've brought a lot of bands to ulsan and most of the bands who did come were ones who were happy to play despite knowing, like, I might not have any money to pay you if no one shows up. But they were just happy to come out and play in a different city because that opportunity was not... Uh, uh, that opportunity was rare. But then on the other side, there were some bands that were reached out and were like, well, we need a minimum of 500,000 won and we want a hotel room for the night and we want this, that, and the other. And I'm like, uh, okay, so that's a different level to what I'm working at. If that's the level that they have reached where they have gotten to that point and that's the only thing that's acceptable to them, that's great. It just means... Obviously, I'm not going to be able to book you because I'm not at that level. Mm. I haven't got that high yet. Yeah. Um, that's not criticism of the band. Well, it's, I mean, would you really? go work? Would you go work a private lesson for ten dollars an hour? Right. Probably not. Yeah. So that's. But then at the same time, sorry, uh, my brain is spinning. Yeah. Before coffee. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm not sure how easy this is going to be listened to, but anyway. No one, no one will talk faster than Scott Kaler. Like I don't even know if we drank coffee, but he's. Th- God, that guy, it, it was like high-speed dubbing, man. But <laughs> Anyways. I would say that in terms of my perspective of touring here, hmm. it's a, my view of it is less about what is best for the band and more of what is best for the Korean scene overall. Hmm. So uh, I had a similar experience in Ireland growing up where all the bands just played in Dublin. Hmm. And the primary scene was Dublin. And if yeah. an international band came to town, they came to Dublin. And then over the years, I started to see that changing and people started to go and play like a, a route around the country, like from Dublin to Cork to Galway to Belfast and so on. And because of those shows happening around the country, 
local bands in each city right. got to see like maybe you are like number one the best band in that town but then someone else comes through who is so far beyond you you realize okay we need to keep stepping it up we have to get better if yeah. we want to make it and it's that realization that you're not there yet or that there is something else to reach for or to aspire towards that's one of the most important things of having bands touring through other cities mm. you kind of get the get the rub there they get the they get to look up and see what right. what what's possible right it's what inspires younger kids to come through and be like okay i want to get to there mm. but at the same time as well having that build up will allow each scene to develop to a point where touring doesn't have to be a loss leading exercise mm. cool right? So for the time being, there's not enough money in touring in different cities. Yeah. Unless you've got support. But if it does keep developing to a point that there are more people coming to shows because mm. there's more bands in each city, because there are more venues opening up, mm. then it becomes a thing where you can come and you can tour Korea. You can play in all these different cities. Mm. So what is a typical, a typical trip south from Seoul? Is it Friday night somewhere, Saturday afternoon somewhere, Saturday late evening somewhere? And back to on Sunday, or what would a normal trip be like for one of these groups? Uh, usually, it's a one-off. Just straight so down, straight just back. Come down, maybe play a show in Busan and go back up. Occasionally, if you've got like proactive people involved, <clears throat> excuse me, you can get someone setting up a show for you on a Friday night in one city. Like maybe play Daegu Friday mm. night and come and play Busan on Saturday. Mm. That can happen, but it's not so frequent. Is that what you're trying to do, or it's what it seems I like that would, would have be like to do? Would make the most sense. sense. Yeah. Um, I have done it in the past. Was it last year, I think, for Zandari Festival, which is, I guess, the main industry festival in Korea. It's where delegates from other festivals internationally come to see the, these bands and try to book them to bring mm -hmm. overseas. A Japanese act came through from uh, to perform for Zandari Festival, and the festival organizer reached out to me to get the show set up for them somewhere else around mm -hmm. the country. And that artist specifically didn't care about money, didn't care about right. uh, how many people were going to come to the show. They just wanted to get out and play other places in Korea. So right. we set up a show on Friday night in Daegu and Saturday afternoon in Busan and then back up to play on Saturday night right. for the festival. But that's in the specific circumstances where money and numbers and everything is not an issue. So are you still trying to, to grow as a promoter? Are you still trying to or aspiring to be that next level or are you kind of content where you are it requires too much time to take the next step i think a lot of the shows that i made were because i was in a city where i didn't find as many shows as i wanted to for the couple of years that i've been living in busan it's a pretty active scene that i reached a point i didn't need to make shows i could just go to shows and enjoy them uh so i moved more towards just trying to get videos at the show trying to document the scene in ways that will survive past just right. the one off nine. Um, so for the last while I've been focusing more towards podcasts and video and trying to, yeah, just documenting more than um, organizing. Very nice. Well, uh, when you're when you're involved in a big in a big live music show, big day south and and whatnot, we've had some experiences with with organizing festivals and whatnot. What are some of the biggest barriers you've uh, you've run into, or, or biggest problems or, or roadblocks you've run into? doing it or has everything gone pretty smooth because music scenes kind of chill nothing ever goes smoothly <laughs> um, but at the same time there's never been anything that's been a complete disaster mm. yeah. uh, so I'm going to just pour some water just uh, so he's, he's pissing under my table I think here, uh, <laughs> um, yeah. I mean I, actually I was, I was looking at that question I was trying to think like what are what are the big things that I've had to deal with over mm. the years? And you never had people cancel in the in the eleventh hour. Oh yeah, no. Yeah, and, and I had a show in Daegu where, um, it was a show that we do called Angle X, where yeah. we partner a band and an artist together and mm. perform on stage at the same time. So you'll have live music and live art happening side by side. Mm. I've done that in Daegu and I've done it in Busan, and the Daegu show was two thousand fifteen, and the the guy who was going to close the night out cancelled. But didn't actually tell me. <laughs> and up next is so it was like two, like an hour or so before he was due to go on stage. Someone else who he knows just came over and was like, "Oh, by the way, did you hear he's not coming?" Oh, godless. Um, 
and that same night also had because there was two levels to it there was an upstairs uh which was like a smaller bar space mm. that we had some acoustic stuff we had some interactive art and in the middle of one of the acoustic performances a fight broke out <laughs> which wasn't great kind of interrupted things a little bit also as a result of that fight one of the musicians from one of the bands wasn't going to play oh, at the yeah. show yeah uh, so that band had to get in a last minute replacement which cool it worked out fine that was not an issue yeah um they were also not at fault in any way for yeah. that incident and as well the very first band to go on the stage that night burst a hole in the kick drum oh geez. The kick drum. so <laughs> oh my geez. god the that's, night from hell that's all manageable mm. that's all stuff that you can handle and roll with and mm. okay the night will still continue the show will still happen i remember mm. big days out in wilson um there's a family band called Tender, who I loved a bit, who have been going for more than 10 years, I think. So it's a husband and wife and their son, Rai. And Rai was just watching in the crowd at that time, I think. He must have been... I think he's eight now, so at that time, just maybe... What's that? Five years? Five, yeah. Uh, three, four. Uh, so he was in the crowd during his mum's solo performance mm. in the afternoon. And um, <laughs> this was in the gallery that was downstairs in the basement. Mm. And when that finished, the whole crowd stood up and went upstairs and out onto the street. And it turned out Rai just went with the crowd. <laughs> and uh, then his mom realized he wasn't there. Didn't know he, had, I guess he had just followed people along the street. And uh, we ended up mobilizing the entire audience of the festival to run around Songnam. This is like one block down from Royal Anchor. So just that whole area, people were combing the streets. Uh, but like, just called the police and was found just so quickly. He's just having a smoke in the alley. <laughs> he just went out for a walk and he was fine. Um, <laughs> he's a fantastically talented child. Like That's he, awesome. He speaks Korean, Japanese, English. He's currently recording his own music, solo no music. He's eight years yeah. old. You know, imagine just, imagine where yeah. he's going to be in 20 years, man. That's, crazy. That's awesome. He's a hell of a kid. So between the magazine, Big Day South, AMP, um, the other festivals, the other stuff you got going on, is there ever any incentive or is there ever any desire to monetize any of it? Or is it just for the pure passion of doing it? Well, no, <laughs> well I think he spoke to it already. You said you you began it because there was no, no scene when you're in Busan. It, it, it exists it, now it you can kind of it keeps yeah. evolving and now going forward i mean or in the future i mean is there a plan or do you think you'll never you won't be in korea long enough so i think there's, there's no sense or there's rumblings of a patreon there is yeah. um just to clarify one thing is that the podcast name was originally amp but that is a terrible name <laughs> it can't be searched for no oh, so okay. i've actually changed the name it's become amplify korea amplify korea um so if you are searching for it after listening to this search amplify korea bring it up on apple podcasts and so on bro your numbers are gonna spike <laughs> oh, yeah. um, i might have double what are these my what are these 10 <laughs> um over the years yeah when we started it off Especially while living here in Ulsan, there was such a great group of people involved. Mm. Um, I, I honestly, a number of times over the last two years, I've found myself looking back at the crew that was here in Ulsan and like, man, I wish they were still around because mm. they were, everyone was so good. Yeah. Um, we had an editor, Trudy Fegan from Canada. Yep. Is it Fegan or Fagan? Sorry, Trudy. Um, Megan from Florida. We had Cindy Labby, who's still in Busan now. Mm. Um, Sean's literary editor. Uh, we had Kara, who was doing all of our graphic design. We had a bunch of university students coming in and doing translation. Yeah. Um, we had so much going on here that was probably something I didn't really appreciate at the time. But also, I was still learning. You never do. You never. Yeah. You never. The, the glory days. You're always looking back on, right? Exactly. I was still. I was still learning how to do right. all of this stuff as well. So I was probably not the most organized or very focused either. Yeah. So. It was one of those times where you had like the perfect group of people for working on it, but not the best direction from uh, <laughs> from myself. But, uh, <laughs> That's all right, man. And that that time was completely volunteer. Like people were traveling over to different cities to interview people because they just loved the band and they wanted right. to go and do it. Um, over the years then, as that's developed further, now I guess people see the name of Angle Magazine and how long it's running and they expect, oh, you're going to pay me for this, right? Mm. And... Fair enough, because, yeah, I want to pay people too. But also, 
since we started uh, between the cost of running the site and hosting and all of the things like podcasts or uh, putting on events and festivals, mm. um, I've put about 10 million won into it myself out of yeah. pocket. Uh, and I'd rather not keep doing that. Mm. Uh, so while I want to keep doing it now, I want it to reach a point where it's self-sustainable. Yep. Right. And with Patreon, we just have a handful of supporters, but it is already Something. covering the cost of the domain and the hosting. Awesome. Which, yeah, great. If I can grow it from there, then I can start paying for people to come and actually write articles. Yeah. But that's something that needs to develop. So so this, the, the Patreon stuff, you have another benefit of the people who join on Patreon, or Patreon, right? Oh, uh, yeah, the you rewards, have this, right? You have extra now or whatever, and that's only for the members from there? Yep, yep. and Fly Extra is just started now. Um, I've done two episodes of it so far. Uh, it's just a short, like, generally about a 10-minute chat with a band who either they have, they've been played on the show that week for maybe they have a new album or they have a show coming up or something like that. Mm. Um, and I have a couple other rewards in the works, but yeah, it, it's been one of those things where people have, people have come on board being willing to get involved in working on stuff, so I've started planning things, and then, you know, with the year that's in it, man, it's hard, eh? I'm not <laughs> going to, uh, I'm not going to hold anyone um, at fault for bailing on something because you know there's already enough for people to deal with in terms of just work commitments and surviving with everything else that's going on absolutely uh, it, it's not the easiest time to get people to come in mm. start on stuff but yeah let's see next month or two we'll see how it goes so when you do those interviews mm. are you doing them in Korean uh, it's English because mm. again the podcast is aimed at I'm aiming right. it for the international audience so so is it, are you limited to who you can do this with Due to the language barrier? No, you said most of the most of the people are okay. Just send the questions ahead of time. Yeah, a lot, a lot of bands will have at least one member who mm. can speak English. Bands who do struggle with it, I can send them questions. They can prepare some answers and translate them if they need to. Should hopefully give me a pretty broad range of people to feature. Let's uh, let's switch gears here to the last last couple uh, last couple questions. First, give me the TMJ, temper mandibular joint, your jaw. You got hit. Oh, that, oh yeah, right, 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 <laughs> damn. That's, listen, that's the, why I listened to the other podcast and you, you mentioned that, and that jumped out. My mom had a problem with that, and mm. it, it was a, a family joke for a long time. Like, uh, It was it was that band that I spoke about earlier that was when we were in London. Oh, okay. Um, the two of us were out at another friend's show. Oh, I thought this was in Korea. No, ah, no, no. okay, this, okay. This happened a number of years back. Okay, so okay. I got you, I got you. Got, got you. smacked a couple of times. I, uh, okay, I had some follow-up questions. I thought that was from Korea, and I was going to oh, ask no. what the what kind of payments happened after getting after getting <laughs> cold cocked in a in a bar. Keep uh, keep going. Favorite bands to watch live outside of outside of Korea. If we're talking about performance, I think the best performance that I've seen put on is i think it has to be prince yeah it was only a three hour show it's not his best like not his longest show let's mm. say but uh, the one moment that really kind of stands out in the middle of that was um okay there were two moments that really stood out in the middle of that one was he played play that funky music white boy to the crowd of pasty white irish people <laughs> dancing in a crowd which i thought was fantastic <laughs> and then there was a moment where he's playing this incredibly intricate guitar solo and he just kind of looks over at the keyboard player and you can see there's something he's not maybe not happy about it or whatever. He walks over towards the keyboard player, moves him away from the keyboard, keeps playing a solo on the fretboard just with his fingertips yeah. and starts playing a counter solo to it on the keyboard. And I'm just... Having, Unreal. Just doing one of those on its own sure. is incredible. Yeah. Doing the two of them together at the same time. Holy... Wild. It was amazing. Two other really great performances that get like a, a courtesy nod are of Montreal who really go very theatrical with their performances mm. um some slightly awkward moments like when the singer had stripped down to just his underwear put on a, the part of the show where basically he hangs himself uh then his put lies down on the ground and someone comes out in like big black robes and does a resurrection ceremony oh, and two women come on and smear his body with fake blood Ooh. and then he comes back to life and he jumps up and runs around the stage again mm -hmm. and all of the band members turn to face into the side of the stage because this smearing of blood has given him um, a bit of an erection oh, in geez. his tiny underwear and <laughs> stage in front of, of many people uh, that was definitely an awkward moment 
Um, <laughs> that sounds. Good. I but saw their it. live show is just all like spectacular performance elements to it. Uh, something that I saw. I saw Tool uh, play their Lateralis tour. Okay. Maybe uh, it was what like the performance was mm-hmm. unreal. Just the the state the have you you know Tool. We saw Tool and Soul, yeah. Man, like if you've seen the if you've seen the uh, the video for Schism, I think they have like those people that walk out kind of like animals. They're walking around the stage and Maynard's behind the screen the whole time. It was, it was a more it was an experience. Mm -hmm. Not really, uh, not really a concert. It was wild. Actually, more recently, that Chemical Brothers show at the Mm. Saint Bernard Rock Festival was also pretty freaking amazing. Um, They actually shipped over so much stuff. They had like 10 trucks coming in in Mm. support of the Inchon. Do they just Um, do a show in front of huge screens? Is that the They had not just screens. They had all kinds of laser lights, everything set up. But they had two giant robots, like like classic retro toy robots that just come forward from the back of the stage in the middle of one of the songs. Just this huge, huge stage production. Really impressive. Speaking of big screens, you saw U2, yeah? Yeah, we saw them up in Seoul there last year for Marquis Marquis yeah 50th I was going to say oh maybe Marquis 50th and I think that was the largest screen ever for any concert anywhere in the world wow. and that was just mind boggling I mean what a performance a- absolutely amazing I'd go see them a hundred times over um, I, uh, they were absolutely fabulous yeah probably my second well, second or third last concert was probably Ed Sheeran two years ago maybe mm-hmm. up in Pentaport mm-hmm. and I had never seen I guess when you listen to him or hear him on the radio, you just think he has a, a band or a group or whatever. But mm-hmm. I was shocked when we went there and it was just him and his guitar. Yeah. And then I went, what is this all just going to be a full acoustic? But he does everything, man. And he loops it all in. And I thought he was, as far as talent, like you said, mm. uh, Prince playing the guitar and the piano. That Wow, Sheeran was amazing at doing all of that stuff together and, and getting the crowd involved and looping it all in. It blew my mind. I, I'd never seen that before. Yeah. And I don't know if that's really common. We talked about it with someone else, Shilly maybe or somebody. Mm. But I, I was floored by how one guy can command that much attention, do all of that stuff while keeping the whole audience engaged. And mm-hmm. he was absolutely fascinating also. Yeah. He learned a lot of that on the streets of Ireland. Yeah. And he used to come over to Ireland this summer and do busking. Yeah. Um, still didn't. Well, he's him. from from England I think okay, okay. somewhere but maybe yep. Irish family or something in there. actually his cousin is a musician in Galway mm. I forgot about that um, she's the very different side of things to him she does more um, performance art mm. very highly visual yeah. side of like music and what was I going to oh yeah U2 experience I think every Irish person goes through like a rite of passage there's a U2 phase somewhere <laughs> at some time you know it's like Canadians but, are um, tragic the hip <laughs> the very first large scale concert that I went to my sister brought me to see U2 when I was 16 yeah. and it was their performance at Slane Castle and it turns out it was the the first time ever that they had Slane Castle had two concerts the two performances in the one year uh, because the demand was so high and Bono's father died in between the two performances Oof. so when the second one came around just one that we went to it was an incredibly emotional performance and at the same time the Irish soccer team had played a game for I think it was for World Cup qualifying earlier that day and they drew two all with the Netherlands and uh, like got the crowd com- I don't know, was it a draw or did we win? Um <laughs> one of those You won. <laughs> whichever way it was it got the entire crowd of eighty thousand just be like, Yeah I was super bummed and like all the bands who followed them because yeah. they, they showed the game in on the big screen yeah, in yeah. the in the uh. Um so they're like well, that's the best warm up act we've ever had. You know? yeah. So um, <laughs> that was that was you know first experience sixteen years old. So it was kind of formative. Also, I think they made a DVD out of that concert because it was such a a big thing. But then again, when it came to the opening ceremony of the Special Olympics, they were the headline act. Yeah. yeah. So I shared stage with Bono. Wow. Um, I think it's incredible to watch some of these guys, fifty, sixty, seventy years old, still. Yeah. I mean, for a lot of them, obviously, it's not the money anymore, but they just still have that. I don't know what the transition must be like from going on tour to just, you know, back to the studio or just regular life at home and then fully just packing it in. Most sports athletes and these guys, most of them are done, you know, maybe mid 30s, late 30s. But Mm -hmm. for the actors and the singers and, and stuff, man, when they can keep going for so long, I just think 
really impressive and, and, and fun to watch them. Like guys my dad used to watch that we can go watch too. Yeah. Albeit maybe a little bit different, but still impressive. Mm. Mick Jagger has not changed. <laughs> still doing his chicken walk around the around the stage there. <laughs> but but lots of them. I mean, I remember Elton John mm. and and Rod Stewart and like maybe Dad was watching those guys in their in their twenties or yeah. something. But still, forty years later, they still got it, man. And geez, they're good. We bought him tickets to Tina Turner, I believe, in Winnipeg, and. Uh, he said, you know, she's exactly like what I remember at 30 years old. And she's 70 year old, still just up there, just owning it, man. So, yeah, it's fun to go to those, fun to watch them. Yeah, you got uh, any top albums you want to... Uh... Well, I wrote down some criteria here. has to be something you can sit down and listen to. Mm-hmm. Album has to be coherent. So, no, no, not, 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 not in... Like, it has to it has to have some, some flow to the album, right? Sure. So we'll use... Uh, more dark side of the moon as maybe mm-hmm. a prototype for that uh significant in the career of the artist so it's either the album should have a, a turning point or it should be a turning point in the band the first or last mm-hmm. album before a breakup etc any ones that uh, that stand out to you um, the 